Hello, you folks. I Welcome always figured that, that, Go ahead. John, one of these yeah. days you're just going to get up and twerk to that dang music, aren't you? <laughs> Who says that I have not? <laughs> there's there's nothing wrong with a little twerking in a recording booth. There's nothing wrong with that at all. What do you got going on? You've been nope. on Bay, Baywatch this week? What do you got going on with your collar there? You, you, that's, uh, that's very... Oh, it... <clears throat> It's very, very 80s handsome of you. No, I liked it. I thought oh, God. when we were in school, we would do that just to show people we were cool, you know? Now it just shows that you didn't realize your collar was up. <laughs> it's all right. Don't worry. It's it's <laughs> it's This is only going out to the masses. We're just fine. So I, I we were talking, uh, the people in the crowd are complaining because it's going to be cold. And uh, <clears throat> I saw Jane, who's in Florida. So I was watching a... Uh, Jody and I were going to do a trip to a cabin up on Lake Erie for Christmas, and we just canceled that because it is supposed to be like it was going to be cold. Well, in blizzard-like conditions, which <clears throat> I yes. love driving in the snow. Don't get me wrong, and I like the cold, but I don't want to die either. There's no no point in that. So we just canceled <laughs> our our cabin trip. But uh, so I was a John likes the snow. Mm -hmm. B John likes the cold, but C John does John does not like dying. Yeah, okay. there's, there's something about dying in there that it's just, it doesn't feel safe to me. So, <clears throat> so I, I was I was watching all these news reports uh, of the weather, uh, trying to get a, a grip on should we cancel or should we not cancel this trip, right? And uh, <clears throat> I happen to see one that's covering Florida, and Jane's in Florida. It's going to be below freezing on Christmas Day in Florida, which is not a very common occurrence. That's actually something to talk about. But then, get this, <clears throat> the Florida news reporter. Without breaking a beat, without breaking a sweat, without, like, she's acting like she's not saying anything unnormal here. She says, be careful of the falling iguanas. And then just moves on. Um, so I had questions. I was, be careful. Apparently, <clears throat> if it gets below freezing, iguanas are in their trees. There's a lot of iguanas in Florida, and they're in their trees. And if they, yes. they're reptiles, <clears throat> if it gets below freezing, they can no longer grip the tree. They've lost all their control over their body. So there are falling iguanas from the trees. When yes, it gets they cold. fall out of the trees and can land anywhere. Have you? People are hit by falling iguanas. That's like... It's like shit out of Revelations. <laughs> I I had to, I looked no, up two or no. three. I, I thought this was just a gag. I thought this was like Florida, man. No, this is a thing. <laughs> no. Yeah, when it gets cold, you have to watch out for falling iguanas because they fall out of the trees. Oh, my God. I I, I thought I'd heard it all, but no, there's a new one. Oh, me. how about... How about an iguana getting into the power system and because of their tails, they short out the power? They In one neighborhood, it's happened three times in the last year. Power outages because of iguanas. <laughs> it makes me, I always wonder like how they figured out like, you know, if you lick a certain type of frog, you can have an acid trip. Like I always wondered how people figured shit like that. It turns out this it's is simple. They yeah. gathered all the frogs and started licking them to see which <laughs> ones made them sick and which ones made them high. It's Florida, man. It's, anything <laughs> can happen. They're falling out of the goddamn trees. That's uh, so. Uh, ma Merry Christmas. Um, welcome to the the show. Um, <clears throat> now, it happy me... Happy Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We got that going on. It looks like I'm going to be pretty much working over Christmas. I'm not going anywhere, so it looks like I'm, I'm going to be right here in my booth, I guess. Well, well, I'll be working up until Christmas. Then I'm going to my family. And then when we come home, I will have my 11-year-old niece till after New Year's. Nice. Well, that's fun and exciting. Yeah, so, so yeah. So, it basically, it means I'm not going to get much work done. <laughs> well... I, I'm, I'm assuming that your 11-year-old niece has come to visit before, or is this the first time? Oh, yeah. Oh, so, oh yeah. She came last year. She came for spring break. She came during the summer. Well, and, She comes and about four times a year. Uncle Andrew's house has to be a blast. You guys have all those antiques and everything. Dude, for a little girl, that's got to be a ton of fun. Just, you know, like each room is a different kind of excitement. There's probably a cupboard where you can enter into another, like, Narnia kind of thing there somewhere, right? Yeah, but it's, it's yeah, but our cupboard goes to Gainia. <laughs> i knew i knew i was see here's what i do i set it up it's like a t-ball i set up the t-ball on the <laughs> you set it swing, up and I, ching! Yeah, swing, hit it right out of the park there um well it, so you got yep. you got you the know, uh, so the, i can hit it right out of the park 
got the new yep. release going on mine, here. This mine is goes the to, Mine goes to, to Gania, where there's no, no where, where the evil witch is, you know, you can just imagine the evil witch is, is, um, is Marjorie Taylor Green. Okay, there's a drop that I don't. Marjorie Taylor, what? I'm not gay. You got to tell me who these people are. I'm not sure who. Marjorie um, Taylor Green, the 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 um, representative from the loudmouth, big big haired representative from Georgia. Ah, okay. You see, uh, I don't even follow you. See, too. she's um, the ice queen in Gania. <laughs> I did not know. Well, now now we know that too. So is is that like a scary picture that you hang up in the room you don't want your niece to go into? You hang up a picture in March. Yeah, that's the scary that's the scary picture that you know you put up on the wall to keep you awake at night. <laughs> that's fit. It reminds me of uh um this old South It works Park. it works for children, <clears throat> it works for gay men, and it works for drag queens everywhere. This uh this old South Park episode is from their very first season. I know nobody likes South Park in here, so this will be a new joke for them. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got cum in my throat. Um, <clears> there <throat> the the mom is is decorating their house for Halloween, and she's singing her song. I'm going to decorate the house for Halloween with scary ghosts and pictures on the wall. And she hangs up a picture of Hillary Clinton <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> and I yep. was, <laughs> like no, 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 but I, I'm just dying laughing. This I'm in my twenties, sitting there smoking dope, watching this, just just die. Like did anybody else see that? Anyways, <clears throat> sorry. Um, the Residence Dilemma. This is your new release. Now I realized when we've done these in the past, in the beginning, I had this cool thing going on where I would read. Uh, and I really need some warming up today. I would read the uh, <clears throat> the the blurb in the beginning, so everybody knows what the book's about. I stopped doing that for some reason. I don't know why. So. I was going to read the blurb before we get into okay. this today. Um, <clears throat> but really, I think what I would prefer doing, if, I'm assuming you've got the manuscript in front of you there. Is that correct? Yes. Could you read the blurb? Because, God damn, I got some cum in my throat, and I'm going to need to clear my throat here. So you read the blurb. I'll read the uh, the. Uh, you've the got dedication. some what in your throat? Cum in my throat. <clears throat> That's what we call it in okay. the industry. That's what well, we call we it in the industry. We all know one when... thing. John, no. John swallows. Okay. Right. You're right. a good it's... boy. That's what it, Kevin's in the crowd. Kevin knows. That's what we call it in the industry when you have phlegm in your throat. I got cum in my throat. It's a professional thing. Sag after it. That's a, <laughs> so, so, oh, so God. you, uh, you, you read, okay. you read the blurb. I'm going to mute my microphone and I'm going to cough a bunch. All right. Your turn. Okay. You're on. Okay. Dr. Rory Milner is just beginning to understand what it takes to survive an ER residency. In his second year, he's changed programs to gain additional experience. But not only does he need to manage the ins and outs of the ER, Rory also needs to navigate around his brother, a charge nurse, who feels Rory should tow his line, especially when it comes to Garth, one of the ER nurses. As a nurse in the ER, Garth West is pre has pretty much seen it all. But a new resident captures his attention, not only because he's good looking, but because Rory seems to care and really listens to the people who come to the ER. He also respects Garth and the rest of the nursing staff. As Rory and Garth work together, they realize that a series of incidents involving botched cosmetic procedures may be related. Working together to uncover the source, they grow closer to attraction. They grow closer as attraction and trust go into something deeper. Rory and Garth will need to stand together when they find when they find they could end their when what they find could end their careers and split them apart. It's a lot harder when the author writes words that way, isn't it? To Kevin and Laura, whose expertise made this story possible. Yes, Kev Kevin is my ER resident n neighbor across the street huh. and the real Charlotte for, for arriving just in time to finish the story. So you're not... Uh... I was writing that when I wrote the last day of the story, Laura had baby Charlotte two days earlier. So baby Charlotte made it into the book. So you're not you're not dedicating any books to your husband these days. I get, I get it. That's cool. That's I did the know. last one. You don't get to complain. It's one, and they they actually helped me with the book. It just shows where Granted, your priorities. I'm not going to tell you that it was that it was last summer when we were all in the pool swimming, and and I got to pick Kevin's brain mm. in the pool. You know, 
in the pool with drinks and snacks. So you, were, and... you were you were in the pool with another man, and that leads to you now not dedicating your books to your husband. Cool. All right. No, my know. husband was there too. <laughs> wow, it's a things John, work a little bit differently John, in Pennsylvania. <laughs> no, John, it's called the four G. <laughs> <Did you bring, laughs> we go from we go from gay Narnia to the four. Wow, that's uh, yeah. Gainia. Thank you for helping me warm up today. I do appreciate this. Um, all right, <clears throat> here we go. The Residence Dilemma, Chapter One. Rory Milner sat at the dining room table in his brother's room in suburban Baltimore. Catonsville, because I'm sure that's how you pronounce it, I researched it in advance, was nice enough. And Patrick's wife, Joanne, was the director for a nonprofit in D.C. that advocated for science and published one of the major scientific journals which was how Patrick could afford to have a home like this with the guest room that Rory could use for a while. The good part of the arrangement was that he wasn't going to have to find an apartment in a market as expensive as the Baltimore area. The bad part was that he had to put up with his brother's sometimes parental glares and watchfulness. Joanne, on the other hand, was kind and thoughtful. Why she'd ever married Patrick was a mystery to Rory, but then maybe she saw a side of Patrick that no one else did. <clears throat> Look, you're working at my hospital for the next year. It's a big enough place, and it isn't likely they will be working directly together, though I do help out in the ER when they need it. Patrick had that older brother, I know best, look down pat. And just because you have the title of doctor in front of your name doesn't mean that you outrank anyone. You're an ER resident, and that's enough, Pat, Joanne said gently. Rory has been through this before. He knows the drill. This is his second year of residency, and he doesn't need you to tell him how the world works. She flashed him a smile. Besides, the baby is kicking this morning and sitting right on my damned bladder, so if anyone gets to do the lecturing, it's me. She pulled out a chair and sat down slowly. At six months pregnant, his slight sister-in-law was already big. You sure you're not having twins? Rory asked, knowing it would make Patrick groan and get under his skin. He was anxious about being a first-time father, and there had apparently been a scare that might have a multiple birth, but it was a single baby. Don't pick on my wife, Patrick said. He was picking on you. I was fine with having twins. It was you who practically fainted at the idea, and we aren't. I'm just showing a lot. She placed Patrick's hand on her belly, and the two of them shared a happy look as Patrick felt his daughter kick. His smile grew soft as he gazed adoringly at his wife, but that didn't stop him from being a dick. Anyway, Patrick said as soon as he returned to his breakfast of eggs and toast. It was the only thing Patrick could make, but he was trying to help Joanne. I have some simple rules. Be good to my staff. Patrick was a nurse a good one by any standard, and had been recognized and promoted to one of the charged nurses in pediatrics. Apparently his asshole side was kept hidden from the kids under his care. Rory rolled his eyes. He was always good to the nursing staff. <clears throat> wow, listen to me go. I don't know what I was doing before this, but that's a lot of cum. He was always good to the nursing staff. They were what made hospitals run as smoothly as they did. Now it's yours. No, this is you. It's Patrick. I thought it was him. Oh, uh, I always you. do. Jesus, get off your high horse. <laughs> it's, it's. I mean, it's, it's not like you wrote the. I know. I'm just. I'm just keep wondering what you've been swallowing, dude. <clears throat> I know, man. Listen to me, go. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> I swear, to you, it's not gay if you have cum in your throat. All right, it's not. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, Patrick Maybe paid you were no having attention. The 4G. It could be. We don't have a pool. That's, <laughs> we don't have a pool. That's the only reason why. I'm telling your wife. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's it's not gay if it's your cum. Patrick paid no attention. You can't and, have that much. Well, I, sorry. I did. I did a book last year where where the guy actually caught the cum in his own mouth. He was. It was one of the jack off scenes, and it was like, uh -huh. I, was, I was like, that's an impressive fucking. Sh he's he has no worries about prostate cancer. That man, it's an amazing shot. Mm, no, no. Just if you watch gay porn, it's done. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it is. Well, I'm apparent, <laughs> apparently, when you're twerking during your own intro, everything has been done. <laughs> it's, 
Um, <clears throat> sorry, let me get back to the story here. Patrick paid no yep. attention. And second, don't fuck a nurse. His glare became acutely pointed. I don't care if you're gay or straight or if the nurse in question is a man or a woman, don't go fucking one. Patrick, Joanne snapped. <clears throat> uh, this is you. Oh, no, this is me. This is me. I think. Yeah, it's you. I know, no swearing around the baby, but she isn't even born yet, and I'm not convinced that they can hear in the womb or that you or that they understand words. He turned back to Rory. I mean it. Do your job and do it well. You were always at the top of your class, and you know your stuff. But getting involved with one of the nurses is the quickest way to mess up everything. The other nurses resent the one who is involved with one of the doctors. It affects the working environment, causes talk, and gets in the way of the job. Once more, Roly, Roly roared his eyes. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to try that one again. <clears throat> Once more, Rory rolled his eyes. He knew how to deal with the hospital environment. He had been working in one for a number of years in one way or another. What bothered him was his brother's heavy-handedness, and he was seconds from snapping at his throat. I have no intention of getting all involved with anyone. I have two years of residence, and I can go wherever I want. Then he could start making some real money and paying off his debts. When his grandmother passed away five years ago, she stipulated in her will that first, Patrick's school loans were to be repaid, and after that, the remainder of her estate was to be put in trust to pay for college and medical school for Rory. There had been enough money to cancel Rory's undergraduate loans and to pay for a good deal of medical school. He was better off than most med students, but he still had debts that had to be paid. Patrick harumphed as he continued eating. Rory finished his toast, then took his dishes to the kitchen and put them in the dishwasher before getting ready to head out. He had a shift in an hour, and he wanted to get there ahead of his starting time. Scene break for more come. And now yep. to the next one. Uh, Dr. Richard, I got it. <clears throat> I have a good doctor voice. <clears throat> okay, go for it. I'm glad you're... No. <laughs> You sound like you sound like Santa Claus. I'm just this is what doctors do too. This is this is my body language for being a doctor. I'm glad you're here. Just like that. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> I'm glad you're here early. The ER is backed up and we could use your help. Get changed and I'll meet you out there. Dr. Richard Headland, the head of emergency medicine at Harbor General, said as he passed Rory in the hall, barely pausing to slow before hurrying back toward emergency. Rory stowed his bag in his locker, changed into scrubs, washed up quickly but thoroughly, and strode out. He passed through the door to the ER and entered organized chaos. He approached Rebecca Vitok, the nurse in charge, because he knew she would have a pulse on where he could help best. Exam room one, Judy said, barely looking up from her computer screen. Then head to four. She actually spared him a smile. We need your help. On it. Rory said, pulling on gloves as he checked the ER systems and got to work. He logged on, read the information they had on the patient, who was a 12-year-old girl, and while he was at it, checked the information for the patient in exam room 4 as well. He had long ago mastered the ability to store information until he needed it. Rory pulled back the curtain and went into the exam room where a mother glared at him. We've been waiting for hours. She was clearly worried, and Rory remained calm and didn't rise to her ire. What's your name? Rory asked the preteen. He already knew the answer, but wanted to get her talking. Shelby, she answered. Can you tell me how you broke your arm? He asked with his gentlest smile. Her mother started to answer, but he met her gaze and she quieted. I fell out of a tree. There were cherries that I couldn't reach. She sounded scared and her eyes were huge. Your x-ray shows a clean break, so I'm going to set your arm for you, and then you'll be able to go home. What color cast do you like? He expected her to say pink or purple. Blue, she answered. To match your eyes? He asked, and Shelby smiled for the first time. Okay, I'll get everything set up, and we'll get you taken care of. The tension and worry in the room had gone from a nine to a four. Rory entered what he needed into the computer system, and ten minutes later one of the nurses came in. Rory said hello, and they got Shelby's arm set and arranged for a prescription to handle her pain for a few days. How long before I can do stuff? Shelby asked. 
Well, it's going to take six to eight weeks for the bone to heal. After that, I'd say you can go back to normal, but ease off on the tree climbing, okay? She nodded, her mother thanked her, and Rory left, taking off his gloves and heading to the next exam room, where a little boy of about six had a tummy ache. Rory greeted Petey the same way he had Shelby, and then continued with some specific questions. What did you have to eat? There was no fever, and none of the signs of the flu. Before he looked for a deeper cause, it was usually best to check the obvious first. Nothing, Petey answered, guilt heavy in his voice. My tummy really hurts. Rory met his worried mother's gaze. He motioned toward the curtain with his head, and she understood his message and stepped out. Are you sure, Petey? Tears ran down the boy's cheeks. I can't help you unless you tell me. Three ice cream bars and some chocolate, Petey whispered. Don't tell Mommy. She'll be mad. I'm not supposed to have milk, but I love ice cream. He cried more and held his belly. It really hurts. Okay, I can help you, Rory said as though they were sharing a secret. I'm going to get you some pills that will make you feel better pretty soon, okay? He smiled and Petey nodded. Then he left the exam room and found Petey's mother. He's, he's lactose intolerant? Rory asked her. Severely. We don't even keep dairy in the house. She wiped her eyes. Is that what it is? Rory nodded. <laughs> Three ice cream bars and chocolate. Apparently he's very overloaded. He's, he's way overloaded what his system can handle. I'm going to get him some, some enzyme pills, and we'll see if they help. If not, we can pump his stomach, but I'd rather no, not do that unless we have to. You can go back inside with him. He returned to the desk, put in the order, and found other patients assigned to him. Rory saw another patient and then checked back on Petey, who was still miserable. The chewables had been given a half hour earlier, and he hoped that they would be providing some relief to the milk souring in Peter's stomach. The curtain parted, and a nurse came in, waiting for Rory, who was taking a second to decide his next steps. Would you like me to give him one more chewable? The nurse asked in a low voice. Oh, wait. I think that's, uh... Is that a guy nurse? No, I've not read yeah, the story in advance. Yeah, that's a guy nurse. Oh, okay, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, in, in these, if it resonates, it's a guy nurse. Well, it could be. I mean, it, it could be this woman right there like that, but I seriously doubt it, so... Let's try the, uh, the, the classic MC nurse male voice. Would you like me to give him one more chewable? The nurse asked in a low voice that resonated in Rory's head with a deep, soothing vibration. He swallowed hard. Please, he answered. The nurse turned to leave, giving Rory a momentary look of what had to be the best backside in Maryland. He didn't have time to gawk, and it didn't matter how good the nurse looked. He was off limits, period. The nurse returned and gave Petey another chewable and some water. I'll be back to check on you soon, okay? Rory shared a smile with Petey and left the exam room, heading for another patient, who he got stabilized with fluids and ready to be admitted for additional tests. At its heart, ER work was fairly simple. Get the patient in and assess them. From there, simpler things were treated. Otherwise, they were stabilized. They stabilized the patient and either admitted them or sent them off for surgery and additional treatment. The difficult cases were those that ended by calling the morgue. They were inevitable, but something Rory and all his colleagues worked hard to avoid as much as possible. Rory went through the routine with two more admissions before checking on Petey, who said he still wasn't feeling better. Can I go potty? Petey asked as Rory was about to check with Dr. Hedlund before requesting a stomach pump. Petey's mother took him down to the bathroom, and Rory shared a look with the nurse from earlier. He doesn't seem to be responding. Oh, I guess that would have been the nurse, actually. He doesn't seem... Oh, and this is the deep male voice nurse. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up, all right? It's okay. He doesn't seem to be responding. I know. I'm going to order a stomach pump, and we'll see if we can't get, get that out of him before it does any further damage. For some young kids, too much milk could act as a mild poison. Rory didn't want to take evasive action, but it might end up being inevitable. I'll get everything prepped, just in case. Rory nodded. I'm Garth, by the way, he said, and Rory got a good look at him for the first time. Damn. It looked like Garth worked out. He filled out his pale blue shirt in the best way possible. 
He had full lips, a Roman nose, and huge blue eyes that seemed to set to see deep into him. Rory refused to squirm at the way Garth looked at him. Interest mixed with a bit of speculation seemed to fill his gaze. Rory swallowed hard and forced the wicked ideas that sprang into his head unbidden right back from where they came from. Rory, it's good to meet you. Rory turned to leave the exam room as Petey and his mother walked toward him. Petey was smiling as he held his mom's hand. I'm better. Rory breathed a sigh of relief. Good. Things seem to be moving through now, Petey's mother said as she lifted Petey back onto the bed. Let's keep him here for a little while longer, just to make sure he's truly okay, Rory told Garth. Then he spoke with Petey about eating milk stuff and how bad it was for him before leaving the exam room, which had suddenly grown very warm, even in the air conditioning. He couldn't get out of there fast enough, and on to his next patient. Another scene break. It would suck really bad to be a kid that couldn't eat ice cream and chocolate. For the love of God, that's horrible. Why did you do that to that poor child, Andrew? Bitch! <laughs> Calm down. Jesus Christ. What? That was Why? my life, dude. <laughs> that was your... Wait, you can't... I've seen you eat ice cream before, haven't I? I swear to God, I've seen no. you eat ice cream. No way. <clears throat> you couldn't if, eat If I have cream. to, I have to take a bunch... I have to take a bunch of pills. My God, that's horrible. No wonder you, I mean, I was wondering what happened to you. I guess that explains it. You just couldn't eat chocolate or ice cream when you were a child. And this is what turned well, out. Well, you can, the chocolate isn't as big a deal. It's the, it's the, the ice cream. Although milk chocolate can have a lot of milk fat and milk solids, which will. Yeah. 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 There's not a lot of, you know, uh, my best friend's from Germany and she made fun of me. I, I sent her, uh, um, uh, Hershey's and milk chocolate. Drops oh God! Hershey's kisses. I sent her those for Christmas a few years ago, amongst other things, on her Christmas present. We put them all in there, <clears throat> and she was like laughing at uh, American chocolate and how bad it is. So me and you have talked about this. We understand that Europe has a different, like it's actually chocolate over there. It's not here. Yep. But but yeah. So you can't eat the real chocolate, or is it you can't eat the shit? Oh, chocolate the darker soup. the better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So dark chocolate. I like I. What I really love is dark chocolate, and that that doesn't have milk in it, so I can go. Yeah, uh, dark chocolate is one of my favorite things in the world. It's amazing. Yes, get it. Oh, you can get really good dark chocolate at Aldi for cheap. Yeah, that's a uh, that's funny. And enough. it's good when, European chocolate. Yeah, when she sends me chocolate from Germany, she'll send me chocolate from Aldi's in Germany and send it to me here, even though I can get it here. But I don't know. It even though you can... coming from Germany. I don't know. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, I just found, amazingly enough, you ever have one of those finds? We were uh, going through our corner cupboard looking for noodles that we bought a few weeks. Couldn't find them. The very top shelf, Jody found a large dark chocolate bar from Germany uh, that, that, that our friend had sent us. It had to have been up there a year. And we found it on the top shelf. <laughs> I devoured that's a, that's that fucker. Oh my goodness! It yeah, didn't take long. exactly. It's dark chocolate. Um, you know, it's like yes, yeah, that was that was found bliss. I did not know that you were lactose intolerant. So next time, I guess instead of leaving you a banana at your table, I'll leave an ice cream like a uh, no a banana split. That's what I'll fucking leave right there. Bananas and ice cream. John, just set them all at your table. Oh my goodness! If gracious. you feed me dairy. An hour later, I can clear a stadium. Well, hey, I'm not sleeping in your bed again, motherfucker. That's <laughs> all. <laughs> so, we, sorry. Sorry for the distraction there. We got one more section to go here. I can <clears throat> fumigate a stadium within an hour of eating dairy. So, <laughs> there will be payback. If you feed this to me, there will be payback. I can clear a stadium too, but it has nothing to do with dairy. I just have to twerk. And it's, uh, it's on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> You twerk and they're hours. running for the exit, huh? 28 hours on, 44 hours off. That was his schedule. And by the time each shift was coming to an end, Rory knew he was pulling each and every bit of energy he had in reserve. He sucked down another cup of coffee in the break room, taking a quick 15 now that the department was relatively quiet and Dr. Hedlund had given him a break. How are you hanging in there? Garth asked as he slipped into the chair across the table from Rory. Are you still in here from yesterday? Yeah. Rory chugged more of his coffee. 
I've got two more hours unless all hell breaks loose. If that happens... He shrugged. Somehow, he would figure it out. He'd worked almost 40 hours without a break once, and he'd do it again if he had to. Then let's hope it's quiet and you can go home. You look beat to hell. Have you had much to eat? Garth set a cooler on the table and started pulling out containers of food. Rory caught their scent and damned if the chicken and fixings didn't smell good. He wasn't much better at cooking than Patrick, and with Joanne needing rest, the meals at home had been sparse and basic at best. I brought plenty. He passed over a container of macaroni salad. Go ahead. Rory had to stop himself from inhaling it. He hadn't realized how hungry he was until the mustardy goodness hit his tongue. Where did you get this? I made it, Garth answered. Rory groaned deeply. A man after my heart, he said before he thought about it. That sort of thing wasn't appropriate, but he left it rather than make a big deal about it. Maybe the long hours were making his mind go to places he knew it shouldn't. Here, there's some chicken salad. Garth passed over another small container and a piece of bread. You're a lifesaver, Rory said. And I thank you. My lunch was going to be out of one of the machines over there, and I was starting to wonder if the stuff in there hasn't, hasn't been petrified by now. Garth didn't break a smile in the least. I know exactly how you feel. I ate one of those sandwiches once and wondered if it had been made in this century or last. He shook his head as Rory took a bite of the chicken blended with cranberries and nuts. It was spectacular, and he closed his eyes to enjoy it. When he opened them, he found Garth watching him, and the same heat built in the back of his neck. Rory had been around enough to know interest when it stared him in the eyes, and Garth was most definitely Rory's type. Strong, but not bulky, gorgeous eyes and hair the color of sand. If they had been on the West Coast, he might have pegged Garth as a surfer. I'm not watching a cook, and neither is my brother, so this is a real treat. Thank you. That's right. Patrick Milner is your brother. I worked with him last year. He's great with the kids in pediatrics. Rory noticed that Garth stopped there, and he didn't press him on it. This was a hospital, and that meant that discretion was always the best practice. Few places on Earth were more filled with gossip than a hospital, and... Uh, ah, and one out-of-place comment could get around faster than the flu. I, uh, heard his wife is pregnant. She is. So he's doing most of the cooking. You can only eat so, you can only eat so many frozen peaches or pizzas or chicken fingers before you crave something good, and this was it. Thank you. He checked the time and drank the last of his coffee. You're welcome. Garth said with a bright smile that sent a zing right up Rory's spine. Maybe we can do it again if our shifts go inside. Damn, Garth was flirting, and Rory was tempted to flirt right back. But that was a bad idea. If he were smart, he'd shut down any possibility with Garth right here and now. But the truth was, he liked the attention, and there was no harm in a little flirting. Still, he got up and thanked Garth again for helping to get him through the last of his shift. Rory pulled open the break room door to leave, telling himself to just go. But he turned around for one more look at Garth and found him watching back. He smiled and left, letting the door close behind him. As he strode down the hall, all he could hear was Patrick's warning echoing in his head. And there you go. <clears throat> Chapter 1 of The Resident's Dilemma, which I'm assuming is just out today. Yep, just out today. Congratulations, good sir. Thank you once again for coming on and entertaining my crowd, because you're far better at this than I am at this point. Um, I'm, assuming, <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming I'm not going to see you again until after Christmas. Is that correct? That's correct. January 3rd, I hope. January 3rd. We should be yes, able we to have, do that. Um, we have good. doggy rescue. We have oh. doggy rescue on January 3rd. We should be able to. Now, we're going to have to play by ear because I'm supposed to be going on a jeeping trip on January 3rd, but this is weather dependent, so um, I, okay. will just, I will let you know when we get closer to. I'd imagine we should be all right, but uh, we, we shall see. I'm pretty sure it's going to ice over, and I'm pretty sure we're not going to be able to do it, but we shall see. So it's I will that, reach it's out. that time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That time I'm of not, year. <clears throat> I'll reach out, and I'll let Jane know as well. So love you all. Have fun. I will see you on Thursday for Rambling Gramlin. Wave bye to the crowd, Andrew, and we will see you all shortly. Bye to the crowd. Thank <laughs> you.